Welcome to Just Add Champagne. We are just getting started. My name is Elise Cordell and I am your host. I'm the National Champagne Ambassador for Pernod Ricard USA covering GH Mum and Perrier Jouet Champagnes. I am here today with a special guest. Her name is Alessandra Estevez and we are going to be talking all about sparkling rosé. So Alessandra, I want you to definitely tell everyone a little bit about yourself and then we'll kind of go over ways that they can interact with us on Zoom and then we will get right into the nitty gritty of these beautiful three wines that you and I get to taste today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Hey guys, my name is Alessandra Steves. I'm based in Miami, Florida. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks Elise. And I am uh, the director of wine education for Florida Wine Academy. So basically at Florida Wine Academy, we teach about wine, we teach WSCT courses and certifications, but we do a lot of fun stuff as well, such as Miami Champagne Week. Uh, and, and now we do have a retail shop called 305wines.com. So I manage that as well. And we are a family business, you know, I've been in the wine industry for the past 10, 15 years. Um, so yeah, great to be here. It goes by fast, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't start in the champagne and in, in the wine world and many of us don't so what were you doing before the wine bug really bit you yeah so i was a corporate lawyer for about 10 years and then you know eventually i changed to the uh, wine industry but I, I i was a happy lawyer but i was you know a very happy taster as well so you know my husband and i we lived in europe for a while in germany and then in switzerland so being there, you have access to wineries, visits, regions. So I kind of fell in love with wine. It's easy to do. There, we definitely have a lot of lawyers in my family as well, and wine was always a part of the conversation. So I think somehow the two go hand in hand. Hopefully it's not because of the stress. <laughs> But just so that everyone knows, we are uh, we do have the chat box available if you would like to interact with everyone. Make sure that when you click the drop down menu, if you want to send something to all of the panelists or if you want to send something to everyone in the webinar so that we can all see your answers. We do have a Q&A um, opportunity as well if there are some questions you would like for us to answer during the course of the Zoom um, experience. And we will be asking you some polls as well. So keep a look out for those. But we are here to talk a little bit about rosé, which is one of my favorite categories and is certainly a category that is gaining a ton of momentum, not just in the United States, but across the world. And so I'm really curious to see maybe some of the things that you've seen, especially now that you have a retailer um, and, you know, what kind of rosés that you like to drink. But I was looking at some of the shipments from 2019 um, from the Champagne region. And I thought it was amazing to see that we've more than doubled what we are importing into the United States since 2010. So we used to import about eight and a half percent of our total shipments were rosé, and now it's more than 16. So that's totally crazy to see that the American palate is really kind of getting after this pink drink, because I think for a lot of time, I mean, and tell me your opinion as well, people weren't drinking pink because they thought it was sweet. Yeah, absolutely. That is the image and the view that everybody had. You know, it is a cheap, uh, sweet wine, so I don't want to drink that. It's it's funny how you say, and you know, I'm glad we made we made we all made this change um, to make you know rosé wine more approachable and um, an everyday drink. I was reading the other day. Uh, it's a master of wine. She writes about rosé. She has a book on rosé wines. Her name is Elizabeth Gabe, and she says that back in the 70s and the 80s. You know, she, she called a panel to taste some rosé wines. And one guy said to her, I'm not going because this is not true wine. So, you know, fast forward 20, 30 years later, everybody, you know, knows rosé. It is a big part of the industry right now. It is growing. You know, here in Florida, it's very popular because of our climate, right? So, so we can make the way of, you know, a refreshing white or a light red and pair with any type of food. So I do agree with you that, you know, this category will continue to grow. Uh, this is not here just for one summer. It is here to stay definitely. So, you know, happy to hear about the numbers from Champagne. I'm a Absolutely. big fan. 
Well, we love the idea of, you know, like hot girl summer. So hot girl rosé summer, I think, is what we would love to have all year round. But I agree with you. It's now something you can have, you know, regardless of the season. And having previously lived in Miami, I know that's when you and I met the first time. You know, of course, it is warm all the time. You can, you know, the sun is shining. I mean, more than 300 days a year. So you're getting plenty of your vitamin D. But now even here in Texas, I know that in Ohio, you know, places, you know, like Chicago, for example, rosé is on the rise. So I think that people are carving out more and more of their list for both still and sparkling rosé, which is super cool because like you said, there's a ton of complexity there. There's some really neat natural wines, some really cool boutique wineries, some really neat things that we've never even seen before that are now being imported. And so it gives you, it's more than just Sutter Home, you know, like these days, which was definitely the foundation for what we understand, you know, in terms of like that, you know, method of production but there's so much more to explore than that. So today we're going to focus specifically on the Champagne region, and this is actually where our first poll is going to come in. So I'm going to launch that now. Feel free to put in your answers. And that first one is going to be what grapes can be used in Champagne. So if you, want to, if you wanted to know what grapes we can make rosé with in Champagne, go ahead and answer now. But as you know, the Champagne region is in the northern, is the northernmost growing region of France, um, and it is in the northeast corner. Now there are specific grapes that we can use. There are six that are pretty popular, but the, there are three that are the major ones. And so you'll find some of those in here. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Meunier. And the region is very cool because it has a very specific terroir and that is this little piece of chalk right here. And this actually came from the caves at Perrier Jouet. Um, but this is really what gives Champagne its beautiful mineral style and allows us to still grow these grapes in very harsh conditions. All right, so it looks like we've gotten some answers here. And a lot of you, I love it. You're, you've definitely gotten it right. So we said Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Meunier, or all of the above. And it is all of the above. And so we'll talk a little bit about why that's true. All right, so Alessandra, tell us about these grapes and why the three of them together really can make for a great blend of rosé. Um, yeah, so, you know, we have to think about using different grapes and blends like each grape can add something to the blend, right? So Chardonnay will add the acidity, will add, you know, this creamy mousse that we see in Champagne. Pinot Noir is there to add body. And then Meunier will add some floral characteristics to the wines. So combined together, we get, you know, this, this wine that is very um, elegant, refined and balanced because each grape is adding something different. So basically in a rosé, we want to look for that, right? We want the acidity of a Chardonnay. So the, so the rosé is refreshing and a lighter style, but you want the fruits coming from Pinot Noir and Meunier, the flute and floral. So you want to have the red fruit characters on the nose, on the palate. So each of the grapes are here, you know, adding something to the blend. So yes, exactly. All of the above, they are all perfect for the blend. And we know that with even with white and black grapes, the inside pulp is clear, right? So how are we actually making rosé both still and sparkling? Very good question. So there are ways to make rosé wines. So of course, you know, champagne and steel wines are a little bit different. So some of you have heard about blending. So in, um, in champagne, you can blend white and red wines. In Europe, you cannot, if you're talking about other regions of production, such as Provence or Tavel in France, you cannot do that. So that is only allowed for Champagne. But there are other ways. So, you know, in Champagne, some wineries do use the, the short maceration. So the rosé, uh, rosé de maceration, they call it. And also we, we see the method called sagné. So there are a few methods to create rosé wines in here. Blending is the most common and the most used. But then again, you know, in the new world, everything is permitted. In the old world, in Europe, in France, yes, you have to, you know, follow the rules. So, so yes, very strict rules, but in Champagne, they can blend. And for those of you who may not have been familiar with the fact that there were multiple ways of making rosé wine, there are different reasons why a producer would choose those, you know, those different methods. So the blending method, like Alessandra said, is the most popular because it offers you the best consistency. 
because of course every harvest every year is going to be a little bit different. For example, harvest this year started very early. I think it was around the 18th of, of August. And you know, so that meant that, you know, every year is going to have the, its little nuances, whether it's going to be rain or sun or cool weather or this, you know, so if you, you utilize blending in order to make your rosé, it gives you a, a more approachable product every year that you can really count on for your consumer base. So saigné, um, or in also in maceration, that means that you're really looking at the harvest on an individual basis. So there are people like, um, producers like, for example, Le Mondier Bernier that are doing saigné rosé. So each one that they produce each year is going to be a little bit different in terms of taste and in terms of color, just because they are so dependent on the harvest from that year. But all rosés are delicious and they range in style from sweet to dry and a lot of the great sparkling champagnes are dry and that makes them excellent for pairing with things. So why don't we taste the first champagne and then we can kind of get in a little bit into some of the aromas that you'll find in vintage and non-vintage. Sure, okay. Mm. So yeah. would you have the Blasom Rosé first? We're actually going to do the GH Mum first. Oh, the Mum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this first. is the GH Mum Grand Cordon Rosé. So mm -hmm. I've got my ISO glass, which is what we use for the WSET. Alessandra is a certified educator, and she offers those classes through the Florida Wine Academy. I'm working on my level three right now, so that is lots and lots of studying. But this is what we taste in. So that yeah. you can be consistent for uh, for your aromas, and then you have to write down everything that you're smelling within their modicum. So, super fun to be able to get into that. But GH Mom, but just take a look at this color. Ooh, yeah, very nice. rich, very coppery. You can see the color through the bottle because the bottle is clear. Hmm. What are some of the things that you're smelling? Yeah, let me show the bottle in here. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that red stripe really, really pops out. For those of you who don't know, GH Mum was founded in 1827. Um, and in 1876, when George Herman Mum created the Grand Cordon, known then as Cordon Rouge, that red sash came from the Legion of Honor. He knew that it would be a great marketing tool because it was one of the highest awards that you could receive as a French civilian. So they, they would know that it was a wine of quality. So that is why it started on the bottles then and is now actually indented into the bottle today. Oh, but the red itself, yes, didn't come yeah. until the 1950s, um, and that was when our winemaker, his name was Rene Lelou, so he made this with an, an artist, his name was Leonard Fujita, and so he was a painter and painted these beautiful roses that were on the property, and so that is where the history of this wine comes from. So it's still pretty young in the grand scheme of the champagne world. <laughs> yeah, I was very fortunate to visit Mum in Brahms last year, but also Pehéjoué, the Maison Belle Epoque in uh, Epernay. So, you know, I visit both houses. Um, yeah, really fascinating experience. What was one of the things that surprised you the most about the GH Mom property? Um, so, yeah, it was the history and then, you know, going to the cryers and, um, and seeing everything. So, so it, it, it is a large property and you are in the middle of the city. You're not, you know, far away. So you're in the middle of the city. So it was a, an amazing experience. Uh, I was there for a visit. It was short, but, you know, we, we tasted a range of wines. And looking at these details, like in the bottom, right? It is engraved in the bottom. It is not something, you know, on top of the bottom. So, so yes, yeah, really great experience there too. Excellent. Yeah. The house style of GH Mum is really based on Pinot Noir. So we were talking about Pinot Noir adding structure, adding a lot of bold character, a lot of richness and red fruit. And that's definitely something that you're going to get out of this. And so in terms of the actual attributes, it's 60% Pinot Noir. And so you're really kicking up, you know, a lot of that Pinot Noir character. And then it's 22% Chardonnay and 18% Meunier. And for those of you who know kind of the scale of sweetness, this is technically an extra brute because it's only six grams per liter of residual sugar in the dosage. So that means that because we're using so much Pinot and it had a lot of ripeness, we dialed down the dosage to maintain that balance. So, but I think the Pinot Noir characteristics are what are coming out most for me in this. Yeah, yeah. So all these strawberry, raspberry type of aromas. And then, you know, you feel the heaviness on the palate, right? So it is, it is not a light body champagne, 
this is heavier in structure. Um, so yeah, definitely. Totally something that is, that is great is on its own, like we're doing right now, but you can pair it with so many different things. And it's even something that we've used in cocktails before. If you go to the ghmum underscore us Instagram handle, they just posted today about a rosé French 75 that you can make. So Ooh. super fun to get to see different things that you can do with your wine once it's open. Um, but I've done wine dinners where we've had different types of seafoods, especially your big meaty fishes, like your tunas. I've also done things with game meats. And so it's kind of cool to see that even people who, you know, during wine dinners will like sneak in their own bottles of red wine. Cause they're like, oh, it's only sparkling. I'm going to bring my own wine to this, <laughs> which is totally okay. And they normally share it with me, but they're always surprised to see that the champagne actually pairs beautifully from start to finish. And then they give me a high five. <laughs> no, I totally agree. So I, I like pairing rosé champagne with meat dishes as well, but I like pairing colors together, you know, so thinking about shrimp or lobster and then, you know, a rosé champagne like this and, and maybe salmon. So yes, not only visually is appealing and interesting, but also, you know, it is delicious together. So. Ooh, that totally makes sense. I love that. Pairing on colors. That's really nice. <laughs> It's like I paired my outfit today, we paired our wine, we're doing our food. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lifestyle choice, right? I mean, if you right. if you guys are my rosé all day people, definitely put that in the chat. We want to see it. Rosé all day, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all year, all life, right? <laughs> totally. Before we even knew that that was a thing. <laughs> Well, you can find this wine pretty easily. Um, it's um, available in Florida, especially through the Florida Wine Academy 305 Wines. You can all, it's usually somewhere between 50 and $55 at retail. So definitely something that's very approachable um, for a nice bottle of wine that you want to have for yourself or you want to give as a gift. So, but for, for me, you know, that strawberry and raspberry, like you were talking about, it definitely has a lot of that tart fruit for me. Sometimes I get cranberry out of it as well. Um, but you'll definitely get like some of like the caramel flavors on the end, you know, maybe like, you know, like a caramelized apple um, or something like that. Um, so it has that nice kind of soft, um, but really nice richness to it. So a great wine for all occasions and one of my favorite ones. To drink. Mm -hmm. They're all my babies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Mary Medina, rosé all year. <laughs> That's what I like to see. Ooh, oh, and Joelle like, said that one of her favorites is rosé champagne with pink macaron. Oh, okay. girl, you fancy. I'm coming over. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's a great pairing. Amazing. So for, and so Joelle actually got everything started here. What we would love to know from you as the audience is what you like to drink with your sparkling or still, or what you like to eat with your sparkling or still rosé. So go ahead and put that in the chat. We would love to see some of your answers and we may end up calling you out as well. So the second wine um, that we are tasting, sushi, love that too. So the second um, wine that we're tasting today is the Paris Jouette Lazon Rosé. So as you can see, like the colors on these two, they look a little bit similar here. I mean, if we were doing it properly with a white piece of paper and we were going at it and we were doing it like for our, um, for our actual exam, sometimes I feel like the GH Mum is normally a little bit darker in color and then the Blazon Rosé has a bit more of the coppery elements. Um, but that's because it's 50% Rosé and then 25% Chardonnay and 25% Meunier because Perrier Jouette is a Chardonnay house. So that's why the styles are going to be completely different. And that's why we wanted to taste all of these next to each other. Ooh, we've got some more things coming in. Ooh, salty snacks like popcorn. <laughs> right after yeah. my heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What have I eaten the most during quarantine? Probably chips and popcorn. <laughs> oh. oh, yes. So beautiful. Yes, so this is definitely a great example of how Chardonnay and Pinot Noir work together in blends, like you were saying. So each one really having those characteristics, like the minerality with then the big, bold flavors, and how those things come together to make for one really beautiful blend. Mm -hmm. Ah, because yes, the house style here is what we like to call floral and intricate. So whereas we were getting more of the fruit on this one, I think I'd get a lot of floral characteristics here. I agree. I think it is such a delicate nose and, you know, you have the red fruits, but they are not as ripe or as um, 
uh, fruit for, forward from the wine one. Uh, this is so beautiful and elegant. Um, yeah. Oh, like gosh. dried flowers and oh, so pretty. Mm -hmm. Our jobs are so hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I know. So I know, quick comment. I know there are some of my students in here. So, hey guys. And you know, they always see me spitting for every class, every webinar, everything. I'm not spitting today, guys. I can't. It is, you know, I do have my speedo in here, but I can't. It is, this is way too good. So I think that that speaks volumes for the quality of these wines. And thank you very much for that. Because we, I don't think anyone would have thought that it was something that was wrong to do. Because of course you want to keep your palate fresh and you want to make sure that you can still put your kids to bed. <laughs> so, like, True. Eventually. We've got some more pairings coming through. So it looks like, ooh, Cheez-Its is a good one because that's got the saltiness. That's got a little bit of fat to it too. So the night, the, it's going to be great with the acidity that's going to be in champagne. It'll cut right through that. Ooh, and then also with Thanksgiving dinner. That's perfect. And figs in brie. You guys, this is amazing to see that so many of you are not only rosé enthusiasts, but also kind of mini gourmands in your own house. So. <laughs> I see that we're all kind of learning skills. Yep, fried chicken and bubbles. That's a big one for me too. This is fantastic. Thank you, you guys. You know, it's good to see that everyone is trying to make the best out of the situations that they're in. So Joelle actually had a great question, um, Alessandra, and I think this would be a great one for you to answer and I can always, you know, pop in as well. But she said, what's the reason that rosé champagnes are usually more expensive than just the ones that are kind of your typical like Blanc style? Um, so it is more difficult to make. Uh, we start with that. So, you know, if you're making a champagne, you're, you're blending three grapes, you know, you, you're just that arrives from the, the vineyard, you press those grapes and you start the fermentation. You don't need the skins. Now to make a red wine first, you do need the skins. So, you know, there is all this cap management technique that we call it. And so, you know, that'll take time. Fermentation will be longer. And then you make a red wine. And from this red wine, you're going to blend back later into the clear wine. So basically you have to make two products to then blend them together. So it is a lot more time consuming uh, for the, the winemaker. You need more space in the winery. You need other tanks or, you know, barrels. So all of this, that means it is more, um, yes, it is, it is dif more difficult for them to do a uh, rosé. Totally. And the champagne process is already so labor intensive. And so that's why a lot of times champagne and champagne rosés are more expensive than their other sparkling counterparts, even if they're made in the traditional method. Because with champagne, every grape has to be picked by hand. A lot of people are still using, you know, basket presses. You know, they have to bring in 120,000 people every year to help make this happen. And plus, since, you know, the early 2000s, the full region as a whole has been trying to work towards sustainability. So like, for example, Mum is one of the first houses that's actually been putting robots into the into the vineyards so that they can kind of help with you know like the management in between the vines you know we're no longer using pesticides you know it's, it's super important that the region as a whole does it because all of their vineyards are right next to each other <laughs> True. Well, you're doing it but your neighbor is not doing it it's not necessarily helping either <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So that's and definitely then, one of the big reasons as well. Ooh, yes, roasted chicken with rosemary. That looks awesome, Mary. Ooh, lobster spaghetti. Eliana, where do you live? Ooh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, Hannah, that's a great um, thing as well. The moon bottles are using recycled glass. They're 70% recycled glass. So they're trying to decrease their carbon footprint. They're also very light. So if you were going to hold that bottle and hold another one next to it, you would notice that the actual carbon footprint of shipment is a lot less because you're not having to ship as much glass and then also make as much glass for the bottle itself. So that all good things that these wineries in the Champagne region are trying to do together because they are trying to do it as a region. And I love that kind of thing because normally we're all so competitive with each other, but now this competition, you know, it's with everybody else. And so that's the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> But this Blazon Rosé, in terms of pairing, so usually in for this wine, it's a, it has a little bit more of a dosage. So usually between 8 and 11 grams per liter, so a, a couple more than what the Mum is. So like when you taste them side by side, you'll notice that they're very different. 
And so this one you can still do with, you know, your savory entrees. I've actually done this one before with bone in filet um, for a wine dinner, which was super fun to do. But then you can also start to venture into the dessert realm. Now, the important thing to remember is that you want your wine to be sweeter than your dessert. But thankfully, with desserts these days, you've got a lot of flexibility with things, you know, that are very fresh. So if you're trying to think like fresh fruits, we talked about the macaroons because they're sweet, but they're not too sweet. You know, so there's a lot of fun that you can kind of play around with that, like pavlovas and meringues. Um, and so it makes it super fun to be able to have it from the beginning to the end. When we were in Champagne, Alessandra, were there, do you remember, I mean, we had some incredible meals. Do you remember specifically any of the, like, of the pairings that we did um, when we were there? I was trying to look for my menus, but we just moved two weeks ago, so my life is in chaos, except for this. <laughs> <laughs> so we had everything from, you know, fish, chicken, meat, uh, fruit desserts, chocolate desserts. Um, so we had, you know, champagne with everything, salads, appetizers, salmon, caviar. So, um, so it is a great beverage because, you know, this high acidity makes you salivate. So that saliva is kind of cleaning your palate. So basically you can pair champagne with everything. And uh, what I like, and you know, this wine is fantastic. Um, the house style of Perrier Jouet, it's so elegant and so refined. So, you know, it is so easy to drink because it feels so silky on the palate as well. So this is a, this is, you know, so easy to drink. It's a, it's a great wine and I, you know, love this uh, Blason Rosé as well. So, so yes, herring, yeah, yes, <laughs> no, it is, you know, delicious and amazing and elegant and refined and, you know, and one of the things that we do analyze as professionals is for the mousse, so, you know, how the bubbles interact in your palate. And in this case, you have these very fine bubbles and very fine mousse that kind of, you know, they feel very creamy on the palate too. So that, that tells a lot about the quality for the champagnes. So, um, you know, another reason, and going a little back to the question, why does champagne cost so much? So there is no champagne that can be made, on, you know, in less than two years. So it takes a while and, and there is rules and regulations that tell you how, how much to age or how, how much time to age. And uh, these wines go beyond that, right? Because it, it is a minimum of three to four years of age. So, so you know, uh, that gives time for this, this kind of, this mousse or this bubbles to get very refined. Um, so pretty wine. That's a great point. And I think that, you know, when it comes to aging your wine, it's one of those things where you can do it yourself, but in Champagne, they kind of do it for you ahead of time. So for those of you who may not know, the minimum amount of time for a non-vintage Champagne to age is 15 months, plus another three after disgorgement before they ship it. And so with our wines, like she said, we use a minimum of three years. So the longer that it ages, the more time that wine has to fully integrate. So if like, if you're talking about still wines and people like to talk about kind of big burly reds, this was aged in oak for 24 months and then for an additional here in the bottle for this many months. And it, it's all about kind of creating that puzzle piece and making sure that the picture makes sense. And so that's what we're doing in Champagne as well. And so that's why there are more than 1.2 billion bottles of champagne in the caves right now. It's because we're, we're looking at the one year in advance, two years in advance, three years in advance. You know, the oldest bottles that we have at Perry and Jouette are from 1825. So it's kind of cool. It's almost like a time, you know, capsule when you walk down into these caves because they're the perfect conditions for storing because they have a specific humidity. It's usually around like that 52 to 55 degrees down there. It's all made of this beautiful chalk soil like I was talking about before. And when you touch the wall, you can feel how cold it is and you can feel, you know, like the moisture that's in the air, which is great for the wine. So just so that just wanted a little, wanted to paint that picture for everybody. <laughs> but rosés, I think both still and sparkling, 
are, you know, definitely, like we were saying, it's a trend. So what are you seeing, you know, like from your clients and, and also from your classes? Like what are people tasting? You know, like what are some of the regions that are kind of coming up? And then I definitely want to know from your perspective, what's mo one of the most surprising rosés that you've had recently? And it could be from like a crazy varietal or it could even be, you know, from a crazy region that we didn't, that wasn't on our radar before. Yeah, so, so first of all, the classes, it's, it's really interesting to see the trends because I feel that the education see the trends before the retail. So um, last year, for instance, we were putting classes about Napa wines, Napa reds. And, you know, the classes were not very popular. And then we put a class about natural wines and the class, you know, was sold out immediately. And then we had a class about rosé wines with different styles, different winemaking techniques class was sold out again. So then we knew that, you know, we had to keep the momentum and keep those classes going on because people were interested in learning what is organic, what is biodynamic, what is sustainable, what is natural. And All then you know, words. Oh, exactly. And, and why are rosé so different? Why, you know, we have different colors, grapes and so on. So, so I see the, those trends and I think it is very interesting, you know, because people want to taste and learn something different too. They have been to Napa, so they know about it. They want to know something else. Um, so that is really interesting. Now for the rosé, so, you know, I've been tasting rosé this year, um, a lot of from different regions, but last or two, two weekends ago, I tasted Domaine Tempier, that is a bundle. I was just going to say, that's been the most popular one for sommeliers, like across the United States. <laughs> it is. So, you know, highly allocated wine. We got six bottles only, and then I got a Magnum, and I opened that, that Magnum, and, you know, it was so amazing. So, and I, and I had to confess something, Elisa, and I'm not telling you because I'm in front of you and in front of people in here, but, you know, when I tasted the Blason Rosé, it was kind of the same feeling of the elegance that I found in Domaine Tempier, but, but now we have the bubbles. So it is, you know, yeah, really this delicate champagnes that are kind of take you to another place, right? So they are not powerful, they are not strong, they are not fruity, but they are so elegant and refined that kind of takes you somewhere. So that is my style. Love that. That's amazing. So I think that there are some people from Ohio on this call as well, or people that are from the Midwest. And for there, it actually is wine country. For those of you who don't know, um, Ohio was one of the top grape producing states prior to Prohibition, and they still make a lot of grapes that are from the Vitis um, Labrusca, which is the Native American rootstock versus that is vinifera, which is what really makes a lot of the grapes that we're familiar with. So one of my most surprising uh, rosé experiences was actually back, I think this was in 2009, I had just moved back to the United States and I was working for the Ohio Wine Producers Association doing special events for them. And I was, you know, writing, you know, this podcast, and then I was also helping with what's called the License to Steal Conference. So they invite owners of wineries from around the United States, especially those that are smaller or really trying to get into it um, and need that support. So they come and they share best practices. They talk about customer service models, you know, and it's really a wonderful way to really lift up the whole industry. So and cool. someone brought in a sparkling pink catawba. And it was, and honestly, I had never had one before. Of course, most of my education in wine was within our typical noble varieties that you find in Europe. And it was so cool to get to try this wine with the winemaker, understand a little bit more about it, and then had it with my deli sandwich and it paired perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know like when you're going to be surprised by something, you know, whether, you know, it's something that's very traditional or whether it's something that's completely out of left field, but it just shows what the range is when it comes to rosé, you know, both from the things that we know and the things that we don't. So, sure. and it looks like Joelle, I love that you're enjoying the Blazon Rosé. She said it's the first time that she's ever tried it. So if any, if any of these wines, if this is the first time that you've tried them, definitely put that in the chat because that's amazing that you guys are trying something new, just like we are trying something new. So I'm <laughs> going to do the second poll now um, for you guys. So I'm going to launch that. And that is all about the, let's see, here we go. That is going to be all about your favorite region for rosé. So we've got a couple of different ones in there. I've, I always like to put some funny stuff in there too, because I want to make sure you're reading it. <laughs> 
And so I want to see where you guys like to buy your rosé from, whether it's still or sparkling. So I don't necessarily have a favorite, you know, while we're waiting for people to come through. Obviously, mm -hmm. the south of France has a ton of great stuff. We were talking about Provence. We talked about Bandol. We talked about Tavel. I mean, the choices are endless when it comes there. And even technically, Corsica is a part of France. Um, but there are so many great, I mean, I can't pronounce any of the great varieties that they have there. It would definitely take me a while to get into it. But it's so cool to see, you know, that that region is known for something like that. Oh, so, oh yeah, it looks like champagne is everybody, is a lot of people's favorite. So that's nice to see Provence coming in at a strong second. And I'm so glad that someone said, I mix my own in the glass. <laughs> I like to be funny. You're doing your own blending at home, just like we do in champagne. So bravo to you for that. <laughs> but it looks like we do have some people that love California. They love Corsica. I, if you guys haven't tried a rosé of Pinot Noir from the Willamette Valley, I would definitely recommend doing that because they are delicious. Um, Kenwood Vineyards, which is one of our wineries in California in Sonoma, also does rosé of Pinot Noir that's available on their website, which we talked about in a previous episode of Just Add Champagne. So there's a lot out there um, that you can experience. So that's awesome that you guys are doing that. So now it is time for, I think, what is the most anticipated wine of the evening for you and I, Alessandra. So let's talk a little bit about this beauty, the Belle Epoque rosé. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <Okay. laughs> so this is a wine that I think ends up changing people's minds and really opening their eyes to the maturation of champagne once it's in the bottle and then also aging under cork and then also the possibilities in terms of the range of flavor profile and what you can pair it with. Yeah. Ooh. This is so complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. So the current vintage that we have available in the United States is 2012. With our, there might be some 2010s there as well, but it was kind of a shorter vintage for us. Vintage champagne is something that is not necessarily made every year, and it's something that is dependent upon the producer's preference. So for example, if Perrier Jouet makes a vintage champagne that year, that doesn't mean that mom is going to do it. It all depends on your house style and the way that the harvest goes. And so it will actually, we'll be figuring that out very soon. Um, we just went through harvest. We're getting through the first fermentation process now. We're getting towards the end of that. And then going into December and January, our cellar masters will start to taste all of the individual lots because we ferment each plot separately. And that's when they'll start to do the building blocks of the various blends. And then they'll decide whether they want to declare a vintage for that year. Now this year was kind of interesting because again, things ripened early, so we'll see. Um, down the road, I mean, it kind of you have to play the waiting game at this point, from, but from what I understand, 2015 and 2016 were absolutely amazing years. And for Perrier Jouet specifically, we made our Brut, Rosé, and Blanc de Blanc all in that year. And that rarely happens. So it's kind of cool because if we make one, we might not make the other. So definitely keep an eye out for that but it'll probably be at least another five years from now <laughs> when they come out. So you kind of have to, you know, but if you're trying to plan, you know, for like a birth year wine for someone or something like that, champagne is often the right choice because it can continue to age over time. But I'm having the 2005 vintage of the rosé and you, I believe, have the 2006. Yeah, so I do have the 2006. Um, so yes, beautiful bottle. See the collar. Oh, Get a fan wow. of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Pretty. It's very beautiful. It is. So, and the story of, you know, the Belle Epoque goes all the way back to 1902 with Emile Gallet. He was an artist during the Art Nouveau period, and he came to the property in order to be inspired after he was invited there, and he found the Japanese anemone that was actually on property. Still grows there today. Um, I don't know. I forget if it was blooming when we were there, but we were all walking through the, the gardens in the back because Nicolas Perrier and Rose Adelaide Jouet were botanists, um, which kind of makes sense for why like so much of the house has inspiration from nature. And so that has always been the icon now for our prestige Tete de Cuvées, um, once they found the bottles that is in 1964. So we lost them for quite a few decades. <laughs> But that's a good thing because during World War I and World War II, they were using the caves of Champagne as prisoner of war camps. 
So if we lost it, that means they couldn't find it either. So that's a win. <laughs> but the rosé um, is something that came about from Michel Betancourt. He was our cellar master prior to Hervé Deschamps, who has been with us since 1983. And it's something that has great has been on the tables of like Grace Kelly um, and you know the Princess of Monaco, um, and then they always had it during the rosé ball, and that you know so it's definitely a wine that has a lot of stature. But I can definitely tell why because like you said, this wine is complex. This wine is pretty. You know, this wine evolves over time. I mean, if you got to taste a 2010 or 2012 today, you'd notice that it was very bright, very fresh. You know, like lots of that fun fruit. Um, that we were talking about with the other wines, but now these, what are you getting out of yours? Um, so, so instead of getting fresh fruits, because now the champagne has aged a little bit, so you have more tertiary notes. So think about, you know, some oxidation in here. So more kind of this nutty caramel type of things, but not in a sweet way. And then all these um, savory notes like mushroom, umami. So, it's really pretty. And then the fruit, it is not a fresh fruit anymore. So this fruit has, you know, think about dried cranberries maybe. So dried fruit, dried flowers. So it is super complex. And then, you know, you do have all these um, notes from, from the extended lease aging. So think about brioche, croissant. So uh, yeah, for me, it's almost going into a French bakery, smelling everything around, right? And then getting a croissant with some marmalade. Uh, yeah, so it is super complex. I would definitely do that. So with my 2005, I'm definitely getting a lot of those notes as well. And then I also get a little bit of like brown sugar and marzipan. So I, I love when rosés especially take on that marzipan kind of feel. And I think it's because of the Pinot Noir, because a lot of times with Chardonnay that, that has that extended leaves, that's when you get like the brioche and butter and all of those. Um, but with this, you get more of that pastry, um, you know, like, like you were saying with marmalade, um, the marzipan and all of that. So it just makes it so scrumptious. So again, you can do this with savory if you'd like to, because again, it's not sweet. It's still very dry. It just has those layers of flavor. But then think about this with like a gorgeous like panna cotta or, mm -hmm. you know, like something that has like a lot of that same richness to it. You know, like you could do like creme brulees. You could do, you know, super fun things like that. I wish that I had a pastry chef on hand. I used to work <laughs> in restaurants and I could just be like, I'm hungry. <laughs> they would just make stuff for me, but not anymore. Uh, but we've had a couple of questions as well that we um, can answer. And so Joelle was asking, would you decant this champagne? And I think that that's a very good question because you can, in fact, decant your champagne. Sometimes with older champagnes, it's nice to do that because if there's any sort of like immediate, like kind of off like aroma, just, I mean, not because the wine is off, but just because it's been, you know, bottled up for so long, that will help wash that out just like it will for still wine but then it will kind of help get a little bit of air in there so that you can start to circulate. That's why we like to have our champagnes in wider gold glasses. If you can see Alessandro's glass, it has that beautiful kind of tulip wide bowl shape. So you can still do a little bit of a swirl. You can get your nose in there if you want to smell it, and that really will help to open it up. I wouldn't say decant your champagnes for a long time because, of course, the longer that it's open, you're going to start to lose bubbles. And these bubbles, especially here, remember we were talking about how fine they were with the Blazon Rosé? They're even finer here because now that carbon dioxide from the second fermentation is so integrated into the wine that it's going to, it's going to evaporate pretty quickly. However, that's not always necessarily a bad thing because once all the bubbles are gone, if you still enjoy tasting the champagne, that means it's of an excellent quality because back in the day, Jim, the bubbles actually helped to mask the fact that the wines weren't ripe enough <laughs> when they actually did the harvest. Um, so the fact, if you can actually enjoy the champagne without the bubbles, that means that the winemaker is doing the right thing both in the vineyards and then also in the cellar. So, so that was a great question. And then Hannah asked, would an early harvest versus a late harvest lend itself to a vintage year or is it about the length of the harvest season? 
again, it really just depends on the producer themselves. So if there's someone who really likes to thrive in Chardonnay, but big, burly, toasty, brioche Chardonnay, they're probably going to want, you know, a little bit more hang time. Um, but if someone wants something that's a little bit lighter in style, a little bit elegant, you don't necessarily have to have that extended hang time. But each harvest is going to be super different because, you know, maybe the spring was nice and warm, but then, you know, going into like the early summer, they had rain. You know, so it's all about trying to like bide your time. So just you're picking according to the grape ripeness. So whether that's early or late really just has to do with how you're tracking the ripening phenolic ripening process of the grape itself. Cool. Hope that that answered your questions. Excellent. All right. Make sure that I'm actually following up with everybody. Just so that everyone knows, we are recording this session, so I will be able to send it out to you afterwards so that you can share it with your friends, especially if you want to open another bottle of wine later. And just to, um, I know Eliana also asked if we were bringing back the hand-painted uh, Pierre Jouet glasses. And we are. We do have gift sets available um, that are usually come out around this time for the holidays. So you will see the Belle Epoque Brute. Um, it should be the 2012 vintage with two painted flutes in the gift set. So if you talk to your favorite retailer, aka Florida Wine Academy at 305 Wines, <laughs> And also um, on our sites as well, if you don't live in Florida, um, then if you look at mumnapa.com or you can also look at Drinks & Co, I can put a lot of that information in the chat for you. You'll be able to find those. Oh man, I mean, so when we talk about Belle Epoque, each, and when we talk about Perry Jouet in general, I mentioned that floral and intricate is our house style. Each one of our cuvées has a different word that goes with that. So like the Blazon Rosé, for example, is floral and gourmet because it's really made for pairing. It was something that was often on the tables of Relais and Chateau over in Europe. So it was a very gastronomically focused champagne. And then this one is floral and extravagant. And I think mm -hmm. that that's yeah, indicative yes. of what we are drinking right now. <laughs> Lucky yeah. ladies. It's so pretty. Yeah. Mm. The bottle is, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. I love the flowers and then, you know, 2006 is a beautiful vintage and you see that if you find one in the market, so I'm tasting 2006 and this is still so fresh and um, delicious and ready to drink. So, so definitely, and at least did comment that the oldest wine she tasted was 1982. I was together with her, so I had the, you know, the ability to taste that wine, which was still fresh and young and, and fizzy. So, um, so yes, definitely, you know, these older champagnes, they give you that pleasure because of the complexity that they have. So. Yeah. Don't be afraid. If you find an older bottle on a retail shelf, um, de you know, talk to the person, you know, who's in charge of the wine area, you know, has it been kept properly? And what was, did you buy it directly from the distributor? Because if you know that it's been kept well, so outside of light and in a consistent temperature, you should buy it immediately. I was with my parents in Charleston, South Carolina for the food and wine festival that they do there. And a few years ago, when we went to one of the seminars, it was at a retailer there and they had a bottle of my birth year Bell Epoque. And I bought it immediately and I still haven't opened it and I really need to. <laughs> but I'm so excited. Well, I, I haven't tasted that one. We tasted my birth year together when we were in Champagne, but from Magnum. So I haven't opened this one that was in a 750 because, of course, the larger the format, the slower the maturation over time. So it'll be super interesting to see from my notes that I took in Champagne what that tasted like versus what this bottle tastes like. Tastes like. <laughs> yeah. But on a personal note, Joelle wants to know, um, how did we become, you know, champagne aficionados? You know, like for me specifically, she was asking if it was if I, when I was working in a restaurant. And that is kind of when a lot of that started for me in terms of really taking it to an educational level. Um, I'd always been around wine um, growing up in Northeast Ohio. My parents, you know, we would go to the wineries on the weekends. My dad helped plant one of the wineries there in the 70s called Marco Vineyard. And you know, so it was something that I was, oh, it was really affiliated with family for me. So it was something that brought joy. 
So that I went to Cornell and they have a great um, hospitality school and they took the wine class um, and then ended up becoming a TA for it afterwards. So that's kind of what started the wheels turning about how I could you know, make this into a career. But yes, when I was a wine buyer in a restaurant, um, that is when I got to taste the most, experience the most. You know, I got, I had my own list of about 525 um, different wines, you know, so that's really, you know, the trial by fire, like, let's really get our palates, you know, calibrated here. So that is kind of when I went down the rabbit hole of wine education. Uh, but what, what was kind of like your turning point? I mean, we were talked a little bit about how you were a lawyer and then getting into this, but like, what really made you want to start the Florida Wine Academy? Um, it was a combination of things. So by, you know, so, so I started writing about wine and then eventually it got serious. I started taking the courses and then I uh, went to, to do the WCT level four diploma in wine and spirits. And that is a very hard qualification. You know, back then only a few thousand people in the world uh, had that qualification. Uh, but I, you know, I always been fascinated with champagne. So I did a certification called Champagne Master Level. So, you know, learned everything about the region. I visit the region as well many times. And, uh, and we are so fascinated about champagne that we created our own Miami Champagne Week. So now we are planning the fifth year uh, for that. But, you know, uh, we wanted to do this celebration. And, and, you know, the champagne for me is the easiest wine to pair. So you can drink it, you know, from breakfast to dinner, if you like, right? <laughs> and it pairs with everything from eggs into, you know, a very fancy dinner or with meats. So I, I find um, that it's such an easy pairing and it's such a, a delicious wine to taste. So, you know, when people ask me the $1 million question, what is your favorite wine? People automatically say, oh, it is champagne, right? Because I see your postings, it is champagne. And I say, yeah, Champagne too, you know, I, I, I don't want to say just, it is just one region, but yeah, definitely. So it is a lot of things brought me to Champagne as well. Excellent. I love that. Well, there is a kind of special anecdote that I have about this particular wine um, as well. And so if you guys have any, you know, like special things that you've had either with the wines that we've had today, so Perrier Jouette and Jage Mom, or any really special, especially sparkling rosé memories, um, definitely put those in the chat. We would love to see them. For me, I got married back in 2011. Um, my husband and I were in Charleston, South Carolina. It holds a lot of special memories for us. But I had invited a girlfriend of mine who I had worked with in a restaurant um, and then also in retail, and her name was Sarah. And she was one of the people I looked up to a lot as a mentor in the industry because she had been working in it much longer than I had and had an amazing palette and even had a tattoo of, you know, like the regions of France, like on her arm. So this girl was hardcore in the best way. And for our wedding, during the ceremony, and then of course during the reception, she gifted us a bottle of Bella Pop Rosé to Aww. enjoy as a newly wed couple. And little did I know, you know, that five years later, I would become the champagne ambassador for that particular brand. So it just shows that all things kind of come in a circle. You never know who you're going to meet and how they're going to have an effect on your life and how champagne is going to somehow be a part of that story. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anybody else's. But what was one of your favorite moments in champagne when you were there last fall? And it could be from anything, but what was one of like the things that will really stick with you that like you brought home, you told your kids, you told your husband, you know, like, and now that you've shared the anecdotes with all of your students. Um, so it was a very interesting time. So we want, went last year in October. It was kind of cold in Champagne. And, um, you know, first of all, visiting Maison Belle Epoque and seeing all the art that they have was amazing because it is just like an art gallery in there. So, you know, all the furniture, everything, it is very, you know, well put together. And then visiting the wine cellars and seeing the art in the wine cellars, that was, you know, the highlight of my life. But little did I know that the next day we, another, we had another highlight. So we went um, to visit the vineyards in Champagne. So think about that. You are in Champagne and you're seeing all these vineyards. They were green, turning to yellow because it was fall um, at the, the time of the year. And then, you know, in distance, you see a bubble in the middle of the vineyards. And I said, oh my gosh, what is that? Are they harvesting? Are they doing something else? But harvest has already gone. 
So, you know, so Peggy Jouet prepared this bubble so we could go in and taste the champagne and, and, you know, we had a sensory experience with touching things and then we were blindfolded and, you know, aromas and, and something. And that was in the middle of a vineyard inside a bubble. So, you know, that was the most extraordinary experience I had in my life. And we were drinking Belle Epoque um, as well. So, you know, vent, multiple vintages and, and the winemaker was with us explaining a lot of different things. So definitely it was a big highlight and it was such a special moment. So yeah. I'm, I'm so glad Very to hear that because we went, we had a lot of back and forth trying to make that experience happen. <laughs> so I'm so glad, but I mean, it was a really cool experience because we got to taste every vintage that had been released of the Perrier Jouet Belle Epoque Blanc de Blanc which was really the creation of Hervé Deschamps, our current cellar master who is now transitioning, you know, um, he's retiring and welcoming in Severine Frerson. So only the eighth cellar master in our entire history since 1811. And then also the first female winemaker we've ever had. So like, it's definitely a year of milestones to be sure, but we got to taste, I think it was 1993. And then I think it went to 1998 and 99 in 2000 and then 2002, four and six. So like crazy kind of tasting. I mean, and this is something again, that's not made every year when it is made, you know, it's, you know, at the maximum we can make maybe like, you know, a couple of 10,000 bottles, you know, like, you know, so it's definitely the unicorn wine of the full portfolio and something that I get really excited about when I get to taste it because <laughs> it's not often. <laughs> Thank sure, you for sure. sharing that. That was really a lot. That was really nice. That was amazing. People have to get back into our Instagram grounds and see the pictures because it was really impressive. We will have to share all those with everybody. So right. we've got our last poll for the night, um, and that is going to be what was your favorite of the night tonight? So if you got to taste along with us, what was the one that really spoke to you? Or if you were able to open up something from your own cellar, we would love to know what it is that you opened up. Put that in the chat for us, because there are some great sparkling and still rosés out there, and we would like to know what you how guys have been enjoying. Ooh, lots of people for the Grand Cordon Rosé. Wonderful. Ooh, someone for Belle Epoque. Love it. <laughs> Ooh, Dan says, the Ron Ron Cat Cafe in Rennes is a really cool place. So recommend for your vacation cat fix. I love that. Is that one of those places like where you can go in and you just like hang out with cats like all day, like kind of like they do in Tokyo? Because that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Eliana said, she said she only had the Mum Napa rosé, um, but that's okay because Mum Napa, of course, came from G.H. Mum, you know, the Guy Devo, who was the winemaker there. Um, he came, you know, he was living in the United States, living in the Finger Lakes, and they asked him to go and check out the best places to make sparkling wine in the U.S. So he went mm -hmm. to the West Coast and found Carneros. <laughs> so that's a great one to be able to try. Let's see. Yep, another person. So Mum Napa, so the Mum Napa rosé sparkling. That's fantastic. Ooh, N.K. Cremant d'Alsace rosé. I haven't tried that one. I'm definitely going to have to look for that. That sounds really good. Thank you, Dan. And Juana also had the Mum rosé sparkling. Mm, mm -hmm. Lots of people are doing Mum. I really appreciate that. Depletion. Yep. <laughs> All mm -hmm. around. Well, it looks like it's a tie, at least in our poll, between the GH Mum Grand Cordon Rosé and then also people opening up their own things. So I'm so glad to see that people are opening up those bottles. You know, there's no reason not to. You know, we have to be able to enjoy them. And then that we got to experience it with you together. So that has been super fun for us, and I hope it's been fun for you, too. Um, if there are any final questions that we haven't answered, um, I think we got to all of the ones that you put in the chat, but if not, let us know. This has been such a wonderful experience. And Alessandra, every every time that you and I get to be together and to talk and to share wines and all of that, it's I learn more about you and I get so even more excited about being able to work with you and being another boss babe in the wine industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, this is so much fun. So our next Zoom tasting, for those of you um, who don't know, will be in two weeks. So that is on October 1st. So make sure that you tune in for that. Um, since you're, if you're already registered on the Just Add Champagne website, that's perfect because I'll be sending out a reminder email 24 hours before. Definitely tell your friends to go and register on our site so that they can join in the next time. I will be doing my best to figure out how to best send you um, the recording of this webinar <laughs> because they are very large files. I might be able to load them onto YouTube. So if I do that, I will be sending everyone the details from today 
And then also, if you joined into our cocktail class last week, I'm going to be putting all the recipes and the recording of that as well. Um, so you guys will definitely get to know about that. It's been so much fun getting to hang out with all of you. Definitely check out the Florida Wine Academy's website and 305 Wines. She has some amazing things on there. And if you're interested in wine education, honestly, the WSET is such a great way to learn. It's very approachable. And, you know, even the level one and level two even if you don't know anything about wine, you're definitely going to walk away feeling more confident, both in terms of your personal ability to taste, to understand, and then of course to go and buy. Because sometimes the wine industry, like it feels like it can, it can be very elitist or not very approachable. And that is the opposite of what people like Alessandra and I want. We want you guys to explore. We want you to have fun. We want you to like really be able to kind of like expand your world and your knowledge and then be able to share it with your friends. So don't forget to follow our social channels. I'm going to type those into the chat right now. And Alessandra, if you have any closing notes as well. Um, oh. yeah. Thank you. This was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and for inviting me. So we are about to launch Miami Champagne Week tomorrow. And we'll have a couple of events coming up in October. And Elise will be our guest. So now she's going to be my guest uh, at the Florida Wine Academy Miami Champagne Week. I feel like there's a Disney to check it there. out. Yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, we'll be back together uh, by mid-October. Yeah. So exciting for that. Yes, Miami Champagne Week. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, but since everything is virtual this year, it makes sense that we'll be able to do it pretty much just like this. <laughs> but we'll yeah. be tasting different wines for that. So definitely you're going to want to check that out and tune in to that. So I put in the Florida Wine Academy's Instagram handle, so you'll be able to find um, who they are, or you can look at www.floridawineacademy.com um, to see all of the events that she has coming up. So thank you guys again. This for episode three of Just Add Champagne. I can't believe we've been doing this for three episodes now. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Um, and hopefully we will see all of you there. Um, definitely reach out to us. I'm going to put, uh, you can reach out to me via my Instagram handle, which I put in the chat as well. If you have any questions, we'd love to see your photos of what you, you know, what you've been trying during the seminar. And we will come back to you soon um, with the next installment. So thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.